Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 13th uh, meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. I would ask everyone in the room to ensure their mobile phones are switched off. You can, of course, use them for social media, but not for photographs or filming proceedings. The first item on the agenda is an evidence session with NHS Scotland. Could I welcome uh, to the committee uh, Jeremy Glockland, Chief Executive, and Dr Andrew Fraser, Director of Public Health science, all, uh, both NHS Scotland. Could I ask Mr McLaughlin to make an opening statement? Hey, thank you, Jim. Um, NHS Health Scotland is Scotland's smallest national health board. Um, we are the National Health Improvement Agency, and we, have, um, we were formed in 2003 by bringing together the Public Health Institute for Scotland, which dealt with a lot of the evidence around health and population health. Um, alongside the Health Education Board for Scotland, who had been responsible for much of Scotland's health promotion. Um, the advantage of that was having within the one body um, not only the function that looked and synthesised evidence, but then try to use that to translate it into usable knowledge uh, to improve Scotland's health. Um, in 2012, uh, uh, about 18 months after I joined the organisation, we developed a five-year organisational strategy, which was called A Fairer, Healthier Scotland. Uh, that signalled quite a shift in our emphasis. Uh, we had heard quite a lot of public narrative throughout 2010-2011, throughout, uh, uh, notably from the then Chief Medical Officer and the new Public Health Minister for Scotland, describing um, health inequalities in Scotland as being Scotland's biggest health challenge. Um, we took that as something of a cue and then looked to try and uh, develop the evidence that we both um, uh, analyse and indeed um, produce ourselves, um, uh, focused much more on the nature of health inequalities and even more importantly on what it takes to reduce health inequalities. Uh, we've just come to the end of that first five-year organisational strategy and set out with a second five-year uh, term, very much sticking with that general theme. Um, an important development within the last year has been following the government's announcement of the Health and Social Care Delivery Plan, uh, plans for a new public health landscape in Scotland. Um, we are uh, both welcoming and enthusiastic about that because it follows on one of the main recommendations from the Public Health Review in Scotland, which commented on the challenges of having um, the national functions uh, for public health sitting with different bodies. So we're bringing them together, we believe, will strengthen the public health contribution to public services transformation in Scotland. Thank you. OK, thank you for that. Um, this is about, uh, as far as I can work out, de um, delivering improved public health in Scotland. So over, say, the last five years, what, I, what tangible delivery has there been as a result of the work of your organisation that any of us could point to and say, that's what happened, that was good value? OK. Um, so uh, let me start off with um, the generality. Um, I think um, concern about health inequalities has never been more central to the... The concern for health inequalities is very well established. You could fill this room with reports that have been written on health inequality. Yep. And I worked with them at your organisation in producing one of those reports. Yep. The assistance I got was fantastic. Okay. But we know the problem, we know the generality. What tangible difference is there? Okay, so um, what we've been doing is working um, both within the NHS, but increasingly with public services more generally, um, trying to ensure that that evidence is able to be used uh, both nationally and in particular locally. Um, so we've worked uh, significantly with a number of community planning partnerships about how they use both their local population health profiles, but actually to use them to make different decisions. Um, so we've worked with um, a, a range of community planning partnerships. More recently, along with a couple of other national boards, we are supporting integrated joint boards in uh, helping them understand the population health challenges in their area in order to make different both policy decisions and indeed resource allocation decisions. Um, we've used a number of uh, uh, ways of doing that. Um, we have, and we've left, left you with, a series of inequalities briefings, which point not only to an analysis of the problem, but um, uh, ways of making different decisions, as I as said. Uh, I think 
the report you may have referred to, uh, 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 Mr. Finlay, uh, may have been about the triple I uh, report. Was that the investments in reducing inequalities? I'm just looking at a number of reports that you've oh. published. Okay, um, I, I, because that very clearly set out, I think, uh, quite a different approach. Uh, so the actions that we need to take to reduce inequalities clearly go way beyond what uh, what we do to just improve the general average population health for the reasons that I think this committee has uh, rehearsed uh, well. So um, one of the things that we've tried to do has been to um, produce less published information simply to distribute it to people and sit down much more with people about saying, what do you do differently with that? So we are now working with teams, um, and a couple of examples of that would be, you'll be aware that there have been a number of fairness commissions um, across Scotland, uh, and we've been specifically invited to help with that. And uh, as recently as the last couple of weeks, um, I, we had one of our senior staff involved as commissioner with the Perth and Kinross uh, Commission, very specifically uh, making a contribution around the importance of good work and fair work uh, towards improving health um, in a local community. Um, so I think there are just some examples. Uh, but, so I have, to, <laughs> I have to go back again. What I was asking for was some tangible examples. So, for example, in, let me pick a random place in Scotland. In Perth and Kinross, have they implemented a recommendation from you that makes a difference to reducing health? And so, have they done something in housing? Have they done something in transport? Have they done something in any field? Similarly, in Highland or Glasgow or Edinburgh, where have they done Okay. Uh, enacted something specific okay. that you have recommended. Okay, so um, the Perth and Kinross one is perhaps a little early because it was published literally just before the election period. I only uh, picked uh, that uh, randomly. No, exactly. But I, I can give you an example. So um, in Dundee, where I sat myself as a commissioner on the, the Dundee Fairness Commission, one of the, um, the outputs from that was that Dundee declared itself uh, a living wage city um, and worked not only within the public sector but encouraged um, private sector employers to adopt the living wage specifically because of the evidence that was introduced about the impact on health of, of a city uh, who, whose, whose health challenges are well known. Okay, thank you. Can I offer something? Yes, of course. Uh, if I could. Um, I mean, it, it is always uh, quite a challenge to um, attribute uh, specific actions to uh, things we've done. We work with others and uh, we influence others and whether Health Scotland uh, was the main uh, influence or not is sometimes in doubt. But Examples might include the place standard, um, uh, putting the health dimension into physical planning and decisions around physical planning, and also the process of involvement in defining a good place. Uh, court evidence for minimum unit price. Uh, I, I think we have been a substantial supplier to uh, government lawyers, or uh, lawyers acting on behalf of the government in the uh, court process. On e-cigarettes, uh, I think we've altered the balance of advice about the uh, uh, use of e-cigarettes in smoking cessation efforts. Uh, on child poverty, uh, directing attention towards uh, adverse child experiences and also rolling out um, uh, an initiative called Healthy Wealthy Children, which started in Glasgow, but we have uh, potentiated its effect, shall we say, across the rest of Scotland. Chairman, one final example uh, from me would be um, uh, we're aware that um, we have a long-term strategy to um, uh, make Scotland a, a, a no-smoking no country. And one of the uh, challenges that government gave us was to help lead the NHS as a, 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 a model contributor to that. And uh, you might be aware of the uh, policy position about um, uh, removing smoking from uh, NHS campuses, which uh, it was always going to be a big challenge. Um, so we led, on behalf of other NHS boards, a fairly major marketing exercise. Uh, uh, and uh, you may have seen it as, as a TV advert, for example, um, which uh, was never going to um, immediately uh, stop smoking uh, uh, in and around NHS grounds. But we've seen certainly a significant reduction in that as part of that longer term programme. OK, I'll bring in my colleagues in a moment. Just to confirm it. You worked with four community planning partnerships. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, who would like to come in on? Ivan. Yeah. That's fine. Just follow up on the place, um, which I mean, to my mind, is important, and I see that in my constituency and other places um, around the country. What's been? Where has that got to in terms of how have you had a? a, um, a a specific impact on planning regulations or on processes because this is great right and we'll agree with that but 
in reality on the ground, it doesn't often happen because of the way the planning process is constructed and the people that make decisions on that are following a set of rules and tick boxes that don't necessarily take account of any of this stuff, um, its impact <laughs> on health. So where have you got in terms of influencing that and making changes to the is there input to the planning review process that's going on or specifics where um, planning decisions have been changed taking account of this impact on health? Well, I don't think the play standard was ever intended to influence legislation, although one would hope that legislation would be complementary to what it's trying to achieve. In a way, the play standard is slightly a misnomer because it's not about standards but of involvement in the process of defining what people want in a good place. Um, it was conceived and developed jointly with Architecture and Design Scotland and, and with planners in the government. Um, so it's a shared ambition and it also has influenced... Uh, well outside the health sector. Um, what's it doing at the moment? Well, it was launched to, uh, to great support. We believe that it, there's quite a lot of work uh, at the at local authority level and planning level to apply its principles and the processes. Uh, the outcomes, I think it's, uh, again, a little early to tell because its uh, launch was, uh, I think, only about a year or two old, uh, uh, ago. Um, but I think it will feed through and make the planning process um, uh, influence the process in terms of bringing people's uh, say, local people's say, into the definition of what a place could be and its attributes and its positive uh, features. So can, can I follow up? Oh, sure, Mr McKee. So, so we've tracked the local authorities who are actively using the place standard and 70% and of local authorities are now uh, are now doing that um, and they are coming back to us also for further ad advice but I, I think the importance of this clearly is that in, the, in planning our new communities and indeed thinking about our existing communities recognising that the very environment in which our children are growing up has a direct impact on, on health. Um, we've had an incredibly enthusiastic response from uh, local government who are, uh, are, are welcoming the fact that they've got an evidence base to plan differently. Right, so you think it can influence, but it's early days for that. It's just because I'm, I'm on the reality of what you see doesn't reflect that. It's what you see is planning, going in, building lots of houses in their own place without regard to facilities or amenities or green space or anything just to get houses up. Um, so you are hopeful that this is going to influence it at some point? Yeah. I mean, m my experience of sitting down talking to planners is that, um, that, that they often are the ones that are as concerned as any of the rest of us about some of those developments. Mm -hmm. What they need is a very strong evidence base to demonstrate why they might resist particular planning applications. But perhaps more positively about um, the value of the investment in, um, for example, um, a, 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 a new area to live in, a new housing estate that actually has paid attention not simply to the needs of car users, but actually getting us to be physically active mm -hmm. because of the way it's actually designed. Um, the benefits of having planned green space in new community development um, it, it has, has a, a, an evidence base on the impact on health for it. So that it does help planners, I think, um, shape some of those developments. Right, okay. I'd be quite closely associated with the Go Well research programme, uh, which has been led from uh, Glasgow Centre for Population Health, and Health Scotland has been a co-funder of that research. Uh, one of the big lessons from that has been not just that regeneration, and there's been billion, billions of pounds uh, within that programme in Glasgow, um, uh, not just about the bricks and mortar and putting up new uh, accommodation and converting and improving it, but it's how it's done, the process of how it's done. And that, I believe, is a very strong message which has now um, been put around uh, a lot of Scotland in terms of lessons learned on regeneration and its relationship to health. You're not going to get an immediate uh, health benefit from re regeneration, but in the long term, uh, the lessons are that if you don't, uh, health suffers. And I think that's sure. one of the uh, products of one of the studies that, again, we've been jointly involved with between Glasgow Centre and ourselves on the uh, Glasgow effect. Yeah, so I think what you're saying is that that there needn't be, or there doesn't need to be changes to legislation or guidelines to change, 
to, to make a positive impact there, which I kind of a bit counterintuitive, find a bit counterintuitive because I would have thought you'd needed to do that. I mean, if you take, for example, the Community Empowerment Bill, which has obviously done stuff that has got the potential to make a difference uh, in, in terms of how space is utilised, but what you're saying is just by the process of influencing, you think that's enough to make a difference? Well, we, we were both at, uh, we jointly uh, um, joined jointly chaired a, uh, a side meeting to the uh, a housing conference uh -huh. in March this year and I was particularly struck by the what the housing associations principally about housing associations how they have changed their culture how they're reflecting on the change of culture towards uh, being community empowering organizations and thinking about the quality of their service to tenants rather than just this major uh, capital investment uh, machine that they may have been perceived as. I think they've changed a lot, um, and I would like to think that that uh, research has helped them uh, enlighten and describe and challenge them uh, on okay. the way through. And certainly uh, anecdotal uh, um, accounts I'm getting uh, suggest that that's the case. Okay, thanks. Uh, Donald. Just on that point, uh, the cross-party group on health inequalities has heard lots of evidence on the place, Dan, and I think it is one of the most interesting things um, that, that is going on in terms of health inequalities. I want to take the discussion on to um, the Scottish Government's health and social care delivery plan, which, as you'll know, um, foresees that by 2019 there'll be a new uh, public health body. Um, and my question is, where, where do you fit into that um, vision? Um, so... At the moment, we are. Um, th there are um, a number of domains of public health, health improvement being one of the very significant <laughs> ones, and we are currently the national body for uh, health improvement in Scotland. Um, so we will go alongside um, the, the health protection uh, function uh, and the health intelligence function into the new body. Um, so we will we will cease to exist as Health Scotland uh, when those plans are implemented. Um, our, uh, our hope and our desire is that we leave a very strong legacy for the new public health body on the basis of the work that we've been doing over the last um, uh, 13 or 14 years. Well, I mean, thank, thank you for that answer. One of the impre impressions that I've um, got over the last year or so, uh, and we've seen a lot of the non-territorial health boards here, um, is that it, it is quite a cluttered landscape. There's a lot of overlap, there's a lot of duplication. Um, in terms of your role and its survival, w what reasons can you give for, for surviving, as it were? So I, I think in any um, orthodox approach to public health, health improvement would be seen as one of the important functions. And the government, indeed, in the review in public health, um, stressed the importance of the health improvement function. But that being operated and managed at a national level, at least, um, in a separate body from uh, the other important uh, contributors, um, uh, we think has been suboptimal, and that's indeed the conclusion of the review. And the government's response has been as a result of that. Um, so I've, I've been very uh, confident, and indeed optimistic, that the national health improvement role will actually only be strengthened by its inclusion in the new public health body. And it's one of the reasons that our own organisation has, and I don't mean simply in the leadership of the organisation, but indeed our staff across the board have been very enthusiastic about the plan changes. If I, if I may add to that, if, if you review the body of evidence about what is effective in tackling health inequalities, particularly health inequalities, uh, yes, there's lots you can do at local level, very local level, uh, and there's more on that, but there is a great deal you can do at national level uh, on uh, legislation, re regulation, influencing policy. I think a national agency such as ours needs to exist in order to press uh, that case, to assemble the evidence, uh, to influence fellow national bodies, for instance in the environment, um, natural uh, um, natural um, uh, environment, as well as uh, things like planning and so on. So I think there is a role, I believe there is a role at national level for a, uh, uh, an agency uh, focused on tackling health inequalities, improving health at national level. You mentioned their legacy. The um, long-term monitoring of health inequalities headline indicators October 2015. The Scottish Government noted in relation to health, the healthy life expectancy there have been no significant changes to inequalities in male or female healthy life expectancy since 2009-2010. That ain't a good legacy. So who's failing? 
Um, I would like to say not us. Um, it, it looks as if we are associated uh, over our last five years with no change. Um, are we getting our message across? I think that's a, a, a question we need to ask ourselves. Uh, so are we, uh, in terms of trying to improve or bec become more influential, are we uh, doing enough there or, or producing usable knowledge? So, can, can I, I mean, I think, I think your message is crystal clear about how, how you change health inequality. But somebody ain't listening and nobody's taking action. Uh -huh. So therefore, as I said before, we could fill this room with reports on health inequality. This is the bloody frustrating thing about the whole thing, that all of us have concerns about health inequalities, yet they grow wider and wider and we see no action. So who's failing? Well, we need to take radical and focused action. Uh, but we're not, so who's are, failing? Well, I think we're building consensus in order to try and succeed. Uh, that's our job rather than... Um, we, we are building the, the evidence on which other people can take decisions. And uh, uh, we are not a political organisation. We are... Um, are they taking system. those decisions then? Are they taking those radical decisions that are required, in your well, opinion? Because you're surely here to give a commentary on them. Well, not all the decisions we would like taken are taken in, in, in favour of uh, health inequalities. Clearly, we, uh, we have a very uh, keen weather eye on all decisions, whether in the health sector or the non-health sectors, many uh, economic and social uh, policies. Uh, very few of them are uh, potentially damaging to health inequalities, but some, and especially some outside this, uh, this um, uh, parliamentary remit, uh, I would argue are. Uh, uh, risky in terms of uh, widening in inequalities. Okay, we'll come can back. Maybe, yeah. can, can maybe just add, add a couple of things. I, I, I think um, it would be fair to say we at times share your frustration uh, around this, but I think there are uh, uh, positive signs around this. So uh, in terms of the current work um, uh, around uh, creating a different approach to fair work and good work, uh, we've been able to influence some of the thinking in government and indeed um, we've made a number of contributions to the Fair Work Convention um, uh, and, and those messages seem to have been taken on board. They're, um, I think, quite powerfully made um, by our own organisation since we've hosted the Healthy Working Lives programme uh, for a number of years now. So I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Uh, likewise, um, there has been, an, um, I think, an, an open-mindedness uh, about the extent to which um, some of the impact of um, the new welfare powers coming to Scotland uh, and the ways in which they could be used in order to uh, certainly mitigate at least some of the worst aspects of, of, of inequalities. Uh, but, but we know, and, and indeed the World Health Organisation would say, that there are some very fundamental uh, uh, causes for that, which you're uh, very familiar with. Um, and, and we need to then think about, with the powers available to us in Scotland, what can we do that would actually allow us to make different decisions? Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, I remain optimistic that... So that, what would you do with the powers that we've got? Um, I, I, I think I would ensure that um, we um, do all that we can to reduce the levels of inequality in, in income. That's, that, that, I, I give, me a, give me a specific oh, policy then. OK, okay. so, so one of the things... Would you increase taxes? Um, I, I'm, not sure, taxes? I, 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 I'm not sure it's uh, for me as the chief executive of a public body to say that, but, but what, I, what I would do is, is, is certainly to say that um, in relation to uh, much of the work, and Andrew cited the um, healthier, wealthier children, we know from the evidence that taking every step within public services to maximise the level of income available to families makes a difference in their health. And uh, we've supported um, both Glasgow in that, but in the rollout of that about the benefits that would accrue from ensuring a much closer integration so that fr frontline healthcare and other public service staff uh, um, are able to direct people um, to the sources of support in a much more integrated way to maximise their levels of income. Okay, Tom. Good morning, panel. Um, in your publication, The Right to Health Tackling Inequalities, it states that we are committed to supporting the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government's efforts to tackle social injustice, working with a variety of partners to address the issues in this leaflet. Can you tell the committee what is your relationship with the UK Government and what engagement you have with the UK Government? Um, we have no direct relationship with the UK Government, um, given that uh, we are a, a National Health Board, um, which is an entirely devolved matter. Mm -hmm. Our relationship would be, from a government point of view, be directly with okay, Scottish Government. Okay, that's an interesting intention to say it's an entirely devolved matter, because in what causes health inequalities within the same publication? 
that this widespread agreement at the primary causes of health inequalities are rooted in the political and social decisions and priorities that result in an unequal distribution of money, income, resources and power across the population and between groups. And goes on to say, um, the fundamental causes result in an unfair distribution of power, money and resources. This often leads to discrimination against and marginalisation of individuals and groups. Now, we know the impact of UK government welfare reforms, and we know how cross-cutting and cross-sectional the, um, the challenges to health inequalities are. Do you think it's possible to achieve your aims of reducing health inequalities without engaging with the UK government, particularly when many of the levers that they control and control solely have such a huge impact upon health inequalities? Um, so I, 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 I mean, I appreciate that um, we will use the international evidence around the causes of health inequalities, which go beyond, of course, the UK as well. And, and, and um, we have a global phenomenon of that um, unequal distribution uh, of resources. Um, in terms of our own constitutional arrangements, we are, um, uh, we are, um, uh, we are responsible to this parliament um, uh, rather than to the, the UK parliament. I, I appreciate that. What I'm asking is, can you realise your goals of creating a fairer, healthier Scotland and reducing health inequalities without any having any engagement at all with the UK government? To give you one example, the family cap is going to drive thousands of children into poverty. But as a corollary of what you're saying is you'll have no engagement with the UK government, no input, and they will have not sought your advice in this matter. Can I um, uh, answer in part uh, what you're asking? We are, we are an agency of the Scottish Government, and uh, prim our primary relationship is with them. We work through them to um, try and influence the UK Government. We also work with our colleague... National Public Health Agency, Public Health England, and they are constrained in the, the agenda they uh, are set by their government, uh, and there are constraints around that uh, too. A number of years ago, I represented directors of public health as a professional group uh, at the Welfare and Pension Select Committee in London. Um, that is one way of finding a route to influence and comment on government policy. We also have done um, uh, solely amongst the UK health um, agencies, health improvement agencies, work on the potential impacts of welfare on health. Um, and uh, much, I, I have to say, supported by the other agencies because they don't feel they're in a position to do so, uh, partly because the, uh, the challenges of, of relating to a government w which is set in a particular direction, uh, we have distance and uh, that brings with it some freedoms limited freedoms, which we are trying to uh, exploit. So um, we have done work uh, on the potential effects of welfare. And that these uh, effects are becoming evident, but I would, would say that the reports we've produced so far um, have not been definitive on that, but the, particularly the mental health, uh, trends in mental health do concern us. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are trying to get our message across. We have also produced uh, work uh, on taxation and the relative um, effects of council tax rise or income tax changes. Um, our feeling is that we can present this evidence, but we can't necessarily say, do this, do that. I think it's for uh, par parliamentarians, uh, politicians to take judgments, uh, and the public and, and commentators to take judgments on what we say, the authority with which we say it, the quality of the evidence behind it. And um, we are there to influence uh, what they do, what they think, what, how they act. In that case, then, would you accept that we are limited in what we can do within the confines of a devolution settlement? I'll give you one example. I had a constituent come to a surgery of mine, a woman who was forced out of work due to chronic ill health, and she wanted to get back into work, but she needed time to recover. But she had lost a particular benefit she was on, and having to go through the indignity of assessments, this was exacerbating existing hypertension. It was also affecting her mental health, where she was, she was in tears at my surgery, telling me she was feeling suicidal, but she wouldn't want to tell her son because it didn't want her son, who was unwell, to get you know, further stressed. Now, given that is something that we cannot fundamentally do anything about in this parliament, and it is having a massive detrimental impact upon her health, would you accept then, on that grounds, that we are limited to what we can do within the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Government is limited, and ultimately, rather than being able to, as this leaflet suggests, undo some fundamental causes, we're merely reduced to having to mitigate them. Yeah. Um, 
I, I'm not inventing excuses for what we do and what the limitations we perceive of what we can do, the influence we can, we can have. Um, we have seen uh, changes and we describe changes. Uh, we, our work on welfare uh, makes the point in the first report that we don't, don't have certainty over the health effects, but we are looking in the following directions. Our second report uh, showed that, that it was still uh, too early to see um, changes. You have to accept that we look back on data about events that have already happened rather than predict uh, because there is no modelling to help us predict the effects of welfare. I entirely uh, accept what you say about um, constituents and people's personal experience, and I used some of that uh, from the deep end practices in my testimony to the Health and Pension Select Committee. Um, we, uh, we are extremely worried and uh, frustrated by the direction in which uh, welfare is going, and that is a professional judgment, uh, but we need the evidence, we need the data, and we will describe the data in future reports about what is actually happening um, at a population level, which is which is where our job is, and to square it with individual accounts such as we get from yourselves and from deep end practices and other research bodies and uh, research knowledge to create a picture of what is happening. Well, I would say I, I too am extremely frustrated and worry, worried at the direction welfare is going, but that would be put in it mildly, but no further questions can be now. Marie. Convener, I'll, I'll just pick up on where Tom left off. I'm, I'm thinking about um, issues like the Resolution Foundation have commented that over the next five years they expect income inequality to grow. And in fact, um, for this Parliament, this UK Parliament, which we're, we're, we're now going to get a new one, aren't we? But uh, the UK Parliament could be the worst for income growth for the poorest half of households since comparable records began and the worst since Margaret Thatcher for inequality. So we have a government in Westminster who are decreasing benefits. The welfare reform has targeted um, disabled people, has targeted the poorest, most vulnerable in society. Um, tomorrow, you know, today we're talking about, in this parliament, talking about the impact of welfare reform on disabled people. Tomorrow we'll be talking about the impact of um, a reduction in housing benefit for 18 to 21 year olds. It is nigh on impossible for this parliament to tackle health inequality when income inequality is so s impacted by the parliament in the UK. Is that not the case? I accept that. I accept that. We, we have limits to the powers we can take to uh, protect the vulnerable, and it's exactly what is happening, which, we're, which is um, we're damaging the income prospects of, of vulnerable groups, vulnerable people. But our job is to study and describe and advocate on the basis of the health effects we know to be happening. And my point, my earlier point, was that we are searching for these effects, but they have not, in terms of how they appear in data, they haven't come up uh, yet. Because partly it took time for uh, the um, welfare reforms to feed through. The real bite um, came in uh, to two springs ago. Uh, so we are now going to see the effects of these now uh, at this time because they will feed through to health events, the sort of events that we will describe in future reports. So, so I, I mean, I, I, I think you'll see from our publications, um, uh, we are not likely to demur from the general principle that um, um, reducing individual or family income uh, potentially has a negative impact on health, and that's our real concern. Um, uh, we, our, our approach is to recognise that uh, in addition to some of those um, uh, fundamental drivers, um, there are other things that we can do uh, in terms of the decisions we make. So if we look at some uh, significant areas um, of policy available to us within Scotland, um, the way in which we approach um, housing policy, for example, can have a real impact on uh, uh, individual uh, and family health and indeed Communities' health, and you know, when we look at the um, the uh, impact of, for example, homelessness on on public health, we see the negative impact of that. Now, these are areas that we can draw attention to the evidence, and um, in addition to Mr. Arthur's 
um, description around those fundamental causes. We have a, a, a middle column a, a, around prevention. There are things that we can do where we could make different decisions that would have a positive impact on health, we believe. And uh, across a number of areas of policy that are within the gift, um, uh, within our gift in Scotland. I know, but it, it's just so striking that the fundamental causes are not within our gift. So I look at this, you know, in the front page of this yep. publication from you, what works to reduce in health inequalities? One, introduce a minimum income for healthy living. We don't have control over that. Ensure the welfare system provides sufficient income for healthy living and reduces stigma for recipients through universal provision and proportion to need. Very little in control over that. A more progressive individual and corporate taxation. We've got control over part of income tax, which is given to us in such a way that it's almost impossible for us to exert any different policy on that. The creation of a vibrant democracy a greater, more equitable participation in elections and local public service decision-making. Very little of this is within our gift in this parliament. It's extremely frustrating. As I say, I, I'm, I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that we would share that frustration. I, 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 I would point out, though, that um, uh, at least um, perhaps it's because I'm an inveterate optimist, um, but partly because also I, I would look to say where can we make a difference and I think in some of the other briefings that you have with your pack um, I, I think you'll see some of the areas we've been doing work to assemble that evidence synthesise that evidence and say so what do we need to do differently and uh, we've given you some examples of that today but we'd be happy to give you, give you more and we'll continue to look at various areas particularly where public services in Scotland responding to, to Christie's challenge um, could make different decisions that would actually drive improvements in health and drive improvements in health in a way that was much more equitable. Um, one of the reasons that we moved away from a focus simply on average population health was, is that um, our health, if you compare, uh, compare it um, across European countries, uh, um, it has improved. It has improved at a slightly slower rate than many other countries. But for me, the big challenge is it's those whose health is poorest and, which, uh, and whose health needs to improve most that are actually um, uh, doing least well in all of that. And that's fundamentally the challenge of why we are not making as good progress as many other countries in Western Europe. Uh, Miles. Thank you, Kavina, um, and good morning to the panel. Um, I was interested, one of the documents in place in communities um, talked about community empowerment. And this is an area of work as a committee we've done quite a lot of work on in terms of all the organisations involved in health in Scotland and decision making around health decisions um, in general. And I wondered if you had a comment on how people actually are being engaged in reforms around health in Scotland. Well, I'll start. Yep. Um, we are... Um, primarily an intermediary organisation, so we uh, are a national agency working uh, to help people at local level. And you've heard that we are engaged with, uh, with specific community planning partnerships and so on. Um, we have marshalled evidence, as you've just heard uh, from your colleague, um, that uh, community engagement empowerment uh, is a very important part of creating uh, improved health uh, amongst individuals and communities. Uh, what's our part in making that happen? I think it's to supply um, the tools and means for people to take local action. Uh, it is to work with voluntary organisations at national and local level to help them and empower them because they're in a very good position, uh, close to people experiencing uh, the effects of inequalities. Um, we are looking at ourselves at the potential of the Community Empowerment Act and how one might evaluate its effects. Um, uh, clearly it's new, uh, it's quite a complex piece of legislation. Uh, uh, we found out that people aren't particularly aware of it on the ground, so we've got a job to do to, uh, to enable that new legislation to have an effect. Uh, and that's really starting from the ground up. So our job is to uh, marshal evidence, advocate, facilitate, uh, get people on the ground to um, uh, modify their plans for action, influence practice amongst health professionals, particularly health improvement professionals. Uh, that's, that would be my interpretation of our role on community empowerment. 
Maybe I can say a couple of other things. One uh, very specifically um, that involves my uh, uh, involves me personally. Um, so the North Ayrshire Community Planning Partnership um, uh, recently produced its community plan and um, uh, formed an advisory group of uh, uh, people who are involved in a number of aspects of um, uh, of, of the business of uh, community planning, including health. Um, I, I, and I was invited to join that. I, I, at the most recent meeting of that advisory group, a very specific uh, uh, discussion point was the extent to which local co communities can be engaged in both identifying areas for improvement within their communities uh, and then actually finding um, a release of resources to support them in that. So I, I think that's a very good example of that. Uh, another one would be that uh, uh, one of the uh, programmes that we um, host within Health Scotland is Community Food and Health Scotland, which supports literally local community groups across Scotland uh, around the importance of food um, uh, in lo local community life, both access to affordable food, um, about the importance of, of food in social cohesion, um, and uh, a number of those local groups are, are, are really very um, uh, heavily involved in their either local community councils, their local community planning uh, arrangements. Thank you. I th in terms of um, my line of questioning, it was more around the reform of health services. For example, here in Edinburgh, the Scottish Government's centralising agenda of health services, so Edinburgh cleft palate and lip surgery for children being centralised through to Glasgow. Um, for me, on a daily basis, I'm finding people who are complaining about the centralisation of our health service. And I was more wondering, in terms of your organisation, how you're making a voice heard on that. Well, I will uh, attempt that. Um, um, I'm going to say something which is perhaps at the limits of uh, where we are in Health Scotland, but um, and it may also be contentious. Four jobs ago, I did a job um, with the National Services Division uh, about highly specialist services. We have got to take courageous decisions about interventions on rare diseases for which there is a need for expertise, the expertise gained largely through seeing a lot of um, the same sort of condition and uh, driving up expertise. Unless we take these decisions and have fewer centres doing better, the outcomes will not improve and the resources will not be freed up to do other things that we would like to see done in tackling health inequalities. We in Scotland have to make some very difficult choices. We have limits on the amount, we will always have limits on the amount of resource available. Unless we do this, Unless, uh, and patients do largely accept that they have to travel for specialist treatment, highly specialist treatment. Um, and you heard last week that even non-specialist treatments, such as cataracts, um, uh, uh, necessitate a journey to the west of Scotland from the east of Scotland. I think largely patients will accept that if we put the case clearly about the consequences. The consequences are outcomes and also um, resources freed up to do other things. Can I maybe mention about the local aspects of public health? Because I think this is an important part of the development of the health and social care delivery plan. Because the government's announcement so far has been simply to uh, reform the national landscape. But um, uh, recently embarked on the first stage of ensuring that we see the positioning of public health in a very different space between local government and, uh, and the NHS. Uh, and uh, I was invited to, um, to an event where uh, local government, senior local government leaders uh, were involved in helping shape what those public health priorities for Scotland would be. Um, so I, I wonder, uh, Mr Briggs, whether that um, might bring some more of a local dimension into shaping those uh, national priorities. Um, and I think the, the extent to which I expect to see a shift, you know, we've, we've seen the public health resources um, uh, relocate uh, in many cases to within uh, health and social care partnerships. Um, but the relationship between, I think, the national priorities for public health and then the local delivery landscape is a crucial, uh, a crucial issue. And what do you think is key then to people not feeling they are empowered when it comes to these decisions? Because it's quite clear people don't feel they're taken, their views are taken into account. Uh, frankly, I'm not going to bring very much new thinking to this. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I would just go back and read the Christie Commission about what they said. On this point, Tom? It was just in, in moving towards having specialist centres and centres of excellence, which I think it's commonly accepted. If we're going to be able to deliver the kind of care and the health technology that is now available, it's 
that will require um, reconfiguration. What, what role do you think politicians have in being able to communicate that to their constituents? And do you think there's further action that collectively has to be taken to really communicate the benefits that will follow such changes of service? Well, I'll, I'll attempt to answer, but I'll try and fold it back into our, our area of focus. Um, quite a lot of our recommendations, where the evidence is about tackling inequalities, uh, is very uh, plain and, and, and simple, and it sounds very straightforward to implement, such as you know, uh, legislation, regulation. At, at local level, or the effect on the individual, or the way they see the world, that's much, much more contentious. Mm -hmm. um, in the clinical side, you have a grateful patient and also um, a very skilled doctor and their medical team around them, and they don't like to see change unless it's explained in their case one over. Uh, so there are stakeholders and players. I think the role of MSPs are to understand uh, what all the dynamics are and, um, and yes, represent their constituents. But there's a bigger picture here about the future of Scotland and its public services and its health service. Uh, one, that, one of the justifications I would make for staying as a national public health agency is that we can do once and well um, what other people could do 14, 22, 31 times um, uh, less, uh, with, with less skill or less, less expertise. So um, I think there is an efficiency and effectiveness and a better outcome from some uh, functions taking place at national level or regional level. It depends on the inter intervention and the type of thing we're looking at. But for highly special evidence, special evidence such as the health effects of welfare, such as uh, uh, refining the evidence on um, uh, interventions to tackle inequalities, such as uh, cleft lip and palate interventions, these things need to be, uh, I think, held at national level so that we get the best out of the public pound. Several times local issues there. Mm -hmm. What impact is the um, budget dis budgetary decisions made here then passed on to local government having on health inequality? Because local government has historically been in the very, very front line in addressing poverty and health inequality. And yet, I can only take my own local authority as an example in West Lothian. We've had 90 million removed for the budget. So, what impact is that having? on the ability to, of local government to address local health inequality? I don't have to hand uh, detailed information on that. Uh, clearly and empirically, less resource available means that they can do less to alleviate the effects of inequalities. Uh, also, the things that local authorities do, um, quite apart from their role in integrated bodies, uh, let's say in transport or in planning or uh, schools and education uh, are fundamental to housing, uh, housing uh, fundamental to um, alleviating or, or um, uh, mitigating the worst effects of inequalities. How can they prevent them? Well, they, there are rules, uh, certainly in the targeted uh, social work, for instance, and the population-wide housing um, uh, and planning side uh, where they can take measures, uh, evidence-based measures, to um, prevent inequalities uh, getting worse. Um, so we have a, a growing relationship with uh, COSLA as the national uh, representative agency and local authorities, and uh, through uh, local public health colleagues, um, local authorities, to try and get that message across. And I believe that closer links uh, with the integrated uh, authorities and some joint appointments um, between um, uh, local authorities and health boards uh, will bring these uh, groups closer. I think also that the review uh, took on board very um, and paid particular attention to local authorities' concerns over the influence of public health expertise on what they did. And I think that is a particular area where we want to see improvement uh, once things settle down after the review and the implementation of the review is underway. Okay. Colin? Convener, um, and uh, good morning to the panel. It's obviously recognised that, that if government's going to play a role in, in tackling health inequalities, that needs very much a cross-departmental approach, but that there's still that perception that the government policy on health 
all too often focuses on what the National Health Service can do rather than what government can do. Um, I think a recent example is probably the mental health strategy, which um, I think was, was widely criticised for not being as transformative uh, as, it, as it probably could have been. Um, so do you think there's enough cross-departmental work when it comes to tackling health inequalities in Scotland at the moment? The short answer is no, um, I, but, but I, 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 I see um, a number of uh, policy areas in which I, I think there's um, real room for encouragement. So I, I think um, the current policy focus around um, educational attainment uh, has broadened the discussion quite significantly um, uh, from what happens specifically in the classroom. Uh, and indeed, we've been invited into a number of related areas of work and understanding the impact of, uh, of family income, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, but also in the way in which um, a, a, a other important dimensions, you know, for example, um, earlier childcare, it can impact on a, a future educational attainment, I think would be examples that I think are, are, are at least encouraging signs. Um, I don't think it's that people don't uh, don't get that intellectually. I think they do. Um, I think it's sometimes just very, very hard, especially, uh, I guess, in the way that we, resor we allocate resources, which are often uh, very much within uh, particular uh, channels, um, that the, at a time, particularly when those res resources have been reducing, um, that it, it, it can be quite difficult to get the, um, th those resources freed up to, to focus on that joint effort. Um, since, since we uh, started on our work on, on health inequalities, we've said from the start that you know, this is not a job that we can do alone. It is collaborative. Uh, again, an area of encouragement is the extent to which particularly local government and you know, I think uh, local elected members, for example, often have a very acute sense of uh, the health in their local communities. Um, and, and local government, I think, has been um, uh, hungry for the kind of evidence that allows them to promote different decision making. Um, uh, and uh, that, that's across a, a range of functions. I think there's also a role, a role for other public services beyond that, you know, anything from environmental protection to transport planning. Uh, you know, if, for example, we want to have an, a more active population, simply telling people to be more active, we actually know from the social attitude study that people know that they need to be more active, but simply telling them to do that is not going to be what will achieve that. And, and the people that we need to get to most are the least active. Um, therefore, one of the things we need to do is think about how do we design a different approach, including our public transport policy, our travel policies, um, uh, but also the in environments in which we are uh, we are building new communities. How do we do that in a way that will actually make people more more active? So I, 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 I'm I'm in, I'm encouraged by at least hearing from those um, organisations and indeed across government about the willingness to to, to consider that it's often much more difficult to deliver in the reality. So, so how do we break down those barriers to making sure it becomes a reality? I mean, an example is you've obviously one of your resources as a health inequalities impact assessment. I mean, how widespread is that used by people other than, frankly, health policy? I mean, you know, does that use right across government? How do you actually break down these barriers that has every department of government basically putting health inequalities at the top of, of their agenda? I think slowly, gradually, perpetually, um, trying to gain influence in places where uh, we haven't been before. Uh, two jobs and 18 years ago, I was uh, in the government uh, as a health policy advisor, and we started to break out of the old mould about health policy being about health services and little else. Um, I think comparing where we are now with where we were then, uh, we are a lot further forward, but there is lots, lots more to do. Internationally, Scotland's seen as uh, way ahead on integrating children's policy. So uh, uh, health interests have a real influence on um, what happens in schools, for instance, more than many other countries. But we are talking to uh, energy officials and the energy minister about uh, uh, efficiency there. You've heard before about housing. Uh, we want to have more influence over climate and sustainability, and we're being heard and, and largely welcomed because people accept um, that if there's a health case, there is more power to the, um, to the case that they can produce uh, as a global reason to do things and change things. So these are areas where we're just getting into it. But 18 years ago, I don't think we'd, I would have ever have dreamt to, to have had such an influence over planning uh, policymakers um, as we have over 
the place standard. So there are cold areas, but we've warmed up a lot of areas. Health in all policies, which is a slogan, uh, maybe, but it, it, we would like to be the embodiment of that. We would like to be everywhere and doing anything. But to come back to uh, a point that Jerry made earlier, uh, we need to look at our priorities and where we have we can get the most influence. And part of that is strategic, part of that is tactical and opportunistic. Uh, where we uh, are heard, it goes back to the other point of welfare and devolved powers and non-devolved powers, we have things to say. It's whether we listen to or not uh, and whether that ground is fertile. So um, what our job is to, is to create the conditions in which... Uh, health can improve and we can effectively uh, tackle health inequalities and these include the political as well as the public and media um, tenor of debate. Uh, so we are there trying to get into other areas um, it, with policy makers and local authorities just as much as we're trying to influence other audiences. And, and maybe one of those other audiences is, for example, employers. And I mentioned the Healthy Working Lives programme. And so we, we were in touch with 7,000 employers last year who were seeking advice on how they create a healthier and support a healthier workforce, not least because that will make them a more productive workforce. And we also host the, um, the Healthy Living Award, which um, supports retailers in uh, promoting better choices in, um, in retail food outlets, and particularly the, the, the fast food sector. So we, we, we're working across a whole range of both public services, third sector organisations. We've worked very, uh, significantly with Shelter Scotland, uh, with the, uh, the Poverty Alliance and others uh, in order to bring evidence to them to help support uh, them in uh, pushing for particular changes. Um, so uh, we, we, uh, we are first and foremost a public services org organisation, but we are actually supporting other aspects of civic life in Scotland. Just briefly, you're a public service organisation, but is it not a bit strange that you have to lobby public service to actually tackle health inequalities? I mean, you're a lobbying organisation by the sounds of it rather than a government organisation because you haven't to lobby the government to actually carry out, frankly, the reason you were set up. So, so I, I don't think we're a lobbying organisation. I've worked for a lobbying organisation in the past and I'm very, very clear uh, that we are a, a public service organisation. But we do have the resources that help examine the evidence of what makes a difference. And where that's not happening, and it's a, I think it's an asset for uh, Scotland's public sector to have organisations like ours, which um, with a very, very small fraction of the total budget that's being spent, um, actually points out and uh, identifies uh, per perhaps unintended consequences of particular decision, decisions uh, made uh, or, or also where we can make a difference, for example, in access to public services and then in the quality of service that some of our um, uh, communities uh, experience. Um, Dr Fraser, um, you said just a moment ago that health policies impact what happens in schools, perhaps more so in Scotland than elsewhere. And I note that from your delivery plan, uh, number two is children, young people and families. Um, you'll both also be aware of the government's priority at the moment in terms of closing the poverty-related uh, attainment gap. So I just wonder if you could give us some concrete examples of where the work you've done has impacted upon healthcare within education. Well, there's a good deal of work going on. Uh not really closely associated with what we've done, but on, on school nursing and uh, schools generally. Um, one specific is on the HPV va vaccine, where it's been a joint enterprise between um, uh, public health and particularly public health, health services and education. Um, and that's a great success. And the data is very encouraging on that. Um, we are in close cooperation, increasingly close cooperation. I think we could go further with uh, Education Scotland about uh, curriculum and integration of curriculum uh, with health topics. Um, we are also doing uh, uh, work around childcare and the quality of childcare and influencing policy around that. Um, so it, it's work in progress. Uh, you're asking for, spe for specific instances. I think it's almost... Uh, it's, Sounds uh, negative, but sounds uh, it's, it's almost as if we uh, are invisible. But we would like to move things and change things, and not even be found out for being health um, uh, health reasons uh, why curriculums change or why the um, uh, content of uh, school activities change. It needn't necessarily be for health reasons. If other good reasons uh, exist and um, 
are uh, more attractive to decision makers. Um, closing the attainment gap, it's not just about schools. It's not just about what happens in schools. It's what happens uh, outside. Um, uh, certainly children coming to school in primary one, ready to learn. That's not a function of the education system as mm -hmm. we have it. And in many ways, I have to say that there's mitigation to be uh, done uh, when children arrive aged four or five uh, at the gates of the school and uh, they're already behind. Yeah. Uh, so we've got to understand that, but also see what, what more we can do in schools, primary and secondary, to help people catch up and to, to not to widen further attainment. But these are functions not just of the education sector. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could add to that because um, the, uh, we host also Scotland's uh, Public Health Network and they produced, uh, I think, a very influential report last year in, in, uh, in May of last year uh, uh, addressing childhood experiences in Scotland and talking about the impact of adverse childhood experiences on learning uh, and a number of other uh, factors. So um, that brought forward recommendations about uh, uh, ways of focusing and, and, and introducing other different actions that helped um, uh, uh, help mitigate some of the, the, the impact of those adverse experiences that many of our children uh, have in, in their early years. Thank you. Okay, well, just about time. I think um, you know my own personal experience dealing with your organisation is that the professionals that you have working for you produce some terrific pieces of research, and uh, uh, I can only compliment them on that. Um, but I have a great sense of frustration that some of the stuff that you're doing is not developing into policy and having an impact on the deep-seated health inequalities that we have in this country. And I think you summed that up when you said. We have an opinion. We just wonder whether anyone is listening. I think that sums it up. Thanks for your evidence, and uh, could we suspend briefly?
Uh, agenda, agenda item two is uh, subordinate legislation. Um, uh, we have one affirmative instrument. As usual, with affirmative instruments, we will have an evidence taking session with the Minister and officials on, on the instrument, and then we will have a formal debate on the motion. Uh, the instrument we're looking at today is the Public Bodies Joint Work and Prescribed Local Authority Functions, etc. Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 Draft. Can I welcome to the meeting Shona Robinson, Robinson Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, uh, Peter Stapleton, uh, Carers Act Implementation Manager, and Kate Walker, Principal Legal Officer, All Scottish Government. Could I invite a brief opening statement from the Cabinet Secretary? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak briefly to the Committee about these amending regulations. Uh, you'll all be aware that when this Parliament passed the Carers Scotland Act 2016 last February, the integration of health and social care was already underway across Scotland. As the committee will also recall, the purpose of the existing public bodies joint working prescribed local authority functions regulations 2014 is to prescribe the mandatory delegation of adult social care functions to integration authorities so that these functions must form part of their strategic commissioning plan for delivering health and social care services locally. We've put forward this instrument to amend the existing regulations so that they take account of the provisions in the Carers Act in the same way. If approved, this will specify that the function of preparing local eligibility criteria under Section 21 of the Carers Act is one which must be delegated by local authorities to integrated integration authorities. The committee will be aware that the purpose of setting local eligibility criteria is to determine whether a local authority is required to provide support to individual carers to meet their identified needs. As you know, the Carers Act will commence in full on the 1st of April 2018. Most of the provisions in the Act are already capable of being delegated to integration authorities. Indeed, carer support services are already part of the integrated arrangements across Scotland under the existing regulations. Mandatory delegation of this function to local integration authorities will help ensure that there is synergy between the strategic planning and commissioning priorities that integration authorities are setting and the legislative requirements to improve outcomes for carers that we as a parliament supported during the passage of the 2016 Act. We are happy to take questions on the regulations. Any questions from members? No questions? OK, uh, if that's the case, can we move on to agenda item three? Um, this is a formal debate on the affirmative SSI uh, on which we've just taken evidence. Can I remind the committee and others that we should not put questions to the Cabinet Secretary during formal debates and that officials may not speak in the debate. Can I invite the Minister to move motion uh, S5M 05457. Uh, I move that the Health and Sport Committee recommends that the public bodies joint working prescribe local authority functions, etc. Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 draft be approved. OK, thank you. Uh, any contributions from members? No. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I'm assuming you don't want to sum up. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, the question is that motion S5M 05457 be approved. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, and as agreed previously, we'll go into private session. Thank you. Cheers.